tonight, the message that I'm going to be preaching, you know, have you ever, you ever read through passages of scripture and you note to yourself, I wonder what exactly that's talking about, and you think, well, I'll get back to that at some point. Th- this is a passage that for, I mean, just as you kind of round through your Bible reading, I'm always like, man, I don't, that, this, I don't understand that fully, and so I'm thankful to have had the opportunity to study and to get in and and hopefully, uh, hopefully accurately kind of interpret the text. And it's a message that once kind of understood, I've, it's, I think it's something to ponder. I think it's something to really think about. And, uh, and, and, and I'll bring in some more things. I think it's really, really appropriate for our church as well. So let's stand and take our Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. Also, if you could put a marker in 2 Samuel 16. We're going to go... ...to 2 Samuel 16, pretty much right after we're done praying uh, at the beginning of the message. So you'll want to be ready for 2 Samuel 16. But I want to start off by reading our text tonight in 1 Kings chapter number 2. Now remember just what's happening. King David is getting ready to pass off the scene... And he is anointing, he has anointed Solomon. And so in verse 1, the Bible says that David is giving Solomon a charge. He's giving him some final instructions of what he needs to do as he enters into this new, this taking the throne and being the king. And now we're going to pick up in, let's go ahead and pick up in verse 5 and look at some of the charge that David gives to Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 5, David says this, Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab the son of Zariah did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner the son of Ner, and Amasa the son of Jether, whom he slew, and shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins, and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do thou for according to thy wisdom, and let not his hoar head go down to the grave in peace, but show kindness unto the sons of Barzelia, the Gileadite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table. For so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom thy brother. And behold, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite of Baharim, which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I'm into Mahanaim, but he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest that thou oughtest to do unto him, but his hoar head bring thou down to the grave with blood." I'm going to preach on this subject tonight. David, a man of grace or a man of vengeance? A man of grace or a man of vengeance? Let's pray. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. And I pray that this this principle, Father, would be helpful to us. And right here in our life and, and the things that we deal with and the people that we interact with. And then also specifically for us as a church family. Bless the preaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Holding your place here in 1 Kings, I want you to go back with me to 2 Samuel chapter 16. And I want us to pick up where David is leaving Jerusalem after his son Absalom has overthrown him in rebellion... And as King David and his men are leaving the city, we pick up in 2 Samuel 16, verse 5, the Bible says this, And when King David, and when King David came to Bahurim, behold, there came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gerah. He came forth and cursed still as he came. And he cast thrones at, uh, stones at David, and at all the servants of King David... And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, 
in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Solomon, of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zariah? So let him curse. Because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more now may this Benjamite do it? Let him alone, and let him curse. For the Lord hath bidden him... It may be that the Lord will look on mine affliction and that the Lord will requit me good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along, the hills, uh, went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. David is leaving Jerusalem and he's got his mighty men with him. And he's fleeing to the wilderness place. And as he does, out comes one of the ancestry of Saul, of the Benjamites. Remember, Saul was a, Benjam- a, man, of ben- a man of the tribe of Benjamin. And so out comes this man, Shimei, who is related to Saul. Now remember, from the vantage point of a, Benj- a Benjamite, right, they saw Saul as this mighty king, this great king, the leader of Israel. And they saw David... ...as being an imposter, if you will... ...one who kind of took the throne away from King David... ...many of the Benjamites really struggled... ...with Saul's death and Jonathan's death... ...and then David becoming king. And so he comes out and he basically says this... ...God is giving you what you deserve. You are being punished for how you treated Saul. Now, by the way, we all know that David didn't mistreat Saul. Amen. I mean, David endured and endured and endured... But, but to Shimei and the Benjamites, they're, they're not, they don't know all this. They don't understand all this. And so he's throwing stones at David saying, basically, you're a bloody man and God's judging you and God's dealing with you according to what you've done to the house of Saul. Which, by the way, can I just stop and insert this? We should be very careful of the judgments that we make of things that we see. You know, sometimes we look at something and it appears to be one way and we think, well, this is happening because of this thing or that thing and we might throw stones or we might make an assessment. But the reality is, is that oftentimes our assessments of things we see are not actually what's going on. And so I love Abishai. Uh, I think every, every pastor should have a good Abishai to come alongside and be a blessing. He said, let me take that guy's head off. And, and so he's ready to go. He's ready to take his head off. And then King David does what King David does. By the way, if you go later into the New Testament, you remember when they wanted to call down fire from heaven and Jesus spoke to the disciples. He used the exact same phrase as David here. What have I to do with the ye sons? It was the same, the same spirit of Christ here that David demonstrates. And he says, listen, this is all in the Lord's will. David is very conscious of his sin. He's aware. He is aware that the day that his sin was discovered, that the prophet Nathan said this. The prophet Nathan said, as long as you are living and reigning, there will be blood in your house. There will be the sword in your house. You know what David knew? David knew that much of this was the consequence of his own sin and and that he was submitting himself to the Lord. And he understood that all these things that were befalling him were the result of things that he had sown in his sin with Bathsheba. And so he tells him, put your sword away. Let him curse. The Lord has bidden him. And there's this amazing picture to me of this man with all the power. He has all the might. He has all the swords at his disposal. And he's walking away from the city of Jerusalem, allowing a man with no strength, no might, and no army to throw stones at him and to call him a bloody man. You know, that you can go back to 2 Kings. I feel like for those of you that know the life of David, you know that that story in so many ways encapsulates his life. 
he was a man who, 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 who bore the errors and mistakes of many people around him. Now, he himself sinned. I wouldn't call them mistakes. He himself sinned and transgressed the Lord in a great way. And no doubt that played a role. But even before he ever sinned, remember this. Remember in his dealings with Saul. Remember his faithfulness to Saul. Remember how even after javelins were thrown at him, even when he could have killed Saul in the cave, David was always this man who commended situations to the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. He didn't try to fight for his rights, elevate himself. He never tried to seize hold of the throne on his own. He never tried to force things to happen. He was a man who allowed the Lord to work. He trusted in the Lord. And, and whether it was his generals, whether it was his sons, whether it was people who were vengeful, David is this incredible life of a man who trusted God and rested in God and allowed God to bring vengeance where vengeance was needed. And we read the life of David, do we not? And, and certainly while there are things that we disapprove of, we know there are weaknesses as a parent, and we know there's weaknesses and sin in his life. At the same time, as a leader and as a man, we see so much good in his life, so much to learn from about his trust in God and his reliance in the Lord, and how he really, truly let even his future be dependent in the hands of God. And so, so, so many of us, no doubt, you've been in situations and I've been in situations where, you know, you've got someone throwing stones at you. How many times in your life have you had someone throwing stones at you and you're thinking, you know, you're thinking and maybe your, your, your friends are thinking or your spouse is thinking, let's take their head off. And you read an account like this and you say, no, we need to trust the Lord. We need to rest in the Lord. We need to rely in the Lord. So many of us have leaned on this life of David and this character of David in, in blessing them that cursing us and doing good to those who hate us and, and, and despitefully use you and use us and persecute us, just as Jesus commends us to do in the Sermon on the Mount. And so it's very interesting to me that, now think about this, think about this, that, his, that so much of David's life was this, this grace, was this man of commending and, 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 and letting things be in the hands of the Lord and then he comes to Solomon. And he says in verse 5 of chapter 2, he looks back to the past. And he says, Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zariah, notice this, did to me, speaking to the fact that Joab had just rebelled against King David and allied with Adonijah. And with Adonijah, Joab and Adonijah were going to try to take the kingdom. And what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner, the son of, Mer, of Ner, unto Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew, and shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins, and in his shoes were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom, and let not his horror or gray hair go down to the grave in peace." He, re, he refers back to Joab and the fact that Joab had just rebelled against him. And he also refers back to in the early days when Joab was his key general. And there were two Israelite generals that Joab took advantage of killing them even when he wasn't supposed to. And he says, I now get it, I remember what he did. Solomon, take his life. Then you have verse 8. And it says, Behold, thou hast with thee Shimei... The son of Gera, Benjamin of Behurim, which cursed me. So he's referring back to the same incidents we just read. With a grievous curse in the day when I went to Mahanim, but he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with the sword. Now therefore hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his whore head bring thou down to the grave with blood. I remember when he was throwing rocks at me. And I said I wasn't going to take him down, but you didn't make that promise, so you do it. But, verse 7, but show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table, for so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom, my brother. And he says, now, but there was also men like Barzillia and their family that when we had fled and when we went into the wilderness, they took care of us and they sustained us and they helped us. So I want you to do good to them just like they had done good to me. 
Now, now this, just when you look at this from a casual glance, this looks like a complete about face from everything we know of David. David, David is saying, I remember he did me wrong. Take his life. I remember what he did. Take his life. Like what in the world? Like I've, I've read this so many times, I'm thinking, what exactly is going on here? Is he old and senile and losing his mind? Has he just been secretly bitter all these years and just been waiting for the opportunity to finally get back at these men? Was he just too scared or too weak to handle it himself? It would almost appear by this last moment of his life, it's almost like everything that we might have thought about David or said about David, it's almost like, was he being fake? Was that not really the case? I mean, it can really throw a challenge into our thinking as far as here he was showing grace, here he was showing grace, saying this is in the Lord's hands, and now he's saying, I remember what he did. Go back and do that and take care of that. And, and that feels, that feels so, get it, that feels so anti-David, does it not? What is happening here? Why, why, is David, why is David giving the command to Solomon to deal with people such as this? Is David reverting back to eye for eye, tooth for tooth? Has he, has he gone from almost like the spirit of Christ to a, you know, you, you do good to me, I do good to you. You did bad to me, now I do bad to you. The answer is no. The answer is no. But there must be an answer. There must be something that helps us understand how is it that a man who behaved a certain way and demonstrated things a certain way, how is it that here in this moment he's literally doing something that seems completely out of character from his behavior? Well, he tells us why. In two different verses. Notice verse 6. Speaking to Solomon, he says this, Do therefore according to thy what? Wisdom. Verse 9. Now, therefore, hold him not guiltless, for thou art a what? Now, he, he may have been wise at this time, but he's about to get a whole lot wiser here shortly. Now, now here's what I want you to get. David's words, is not a, they are not about vengeance. They are not about hatred. They are not about weakness. They are not about bitterness. You know what those, these words are? These are words of wisdom. Okay, now let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Wisdom. Let me give you a couple definitions. The right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice, listen carefully, the choice of laudable ends and the best means to accomplish them. If wisdom, this is Mr. Webster talking, if wisdom is to be considered as a faculty of the mind, it is a faculty of discerning oh, or judging what is the most proper, just, and useful. And if it is to be considered an acquirement, it is the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conducive to prosperity or happiness. Wisdom is the ability, this is now me, my definition, wisdom is the ability to take the knowledge of God and apply it in a way to produce the most biblical and best outcome. Wisdom is the capacity to take truth and to look at a situation and say, in this situation, this truth needs to be applied in this way to get the most biblical and spiritual and best result. Wisdom, listen, wisdom is not copy and paste. Wisdom is not, okay, this is what we do every single time, every instance. Wisdom is the capacity. It's like someone who's fixing a car. It's like someone who builds things. They may use the same tools. They may, use, they may have the same vehicle in front of them, but a different make, a different model, a different year, a different situation might require different application with all those things that they know. David was a man of wisdom, and he is telling Solomon in his place, he needs to be a man of wisdom. Okay, so I want you to walk through this with me a little bit. 
When David was becoming king, he was already known as a warrior. He, he, he was already known and established as the man before he was ever king, he slew Goliath. Are you with me tonight? Before he ever was king, he slew Goliath. Before he ever was king, he led troops for Saul out and slayed Matter of fact, they had songs about how many Philistines he personally had slain. So, so David was a man who was understood. He, he, was, he was recognized for strength. He was recognized for power. He was recognized as a man of war and a great leader. And he had men with him that were fiercely loyal and fighters. When David... When David first became king, remember this, that all of Israel did not anoint David at the beginning. It was only his tribe, Judah, that had initially anointed him to be king, while the, the people of Israel followed Saul and then his son. And they, so you have 11 tribes following Saul's son, and David has his kingdom, Judah. So eventually, over time, when, when Israel came to David and said, we want you to be king. Now, here's what you need to remember. That the, the, that the people of Judah and the people of Israel had been fighting each other for years. That before David ever became kingdom, David had a general named Joab. And, and Israel had a, had, a, had a captain named Abner. And these men sent their men and they killed one another. And now, get this, now there's supposed to be one big happy kingdom. You hearing me? There, there, was, there was a fracture that existed between Israel and Judah that needed healing. So, now get this, so when a man like Shimei comes out and is throwing rocks at King David... Nobody in the house, if you will, is going to think that David is a weak man. You getting this? David is established that he's won a lot of battles. There's nobody looking at David. Please hear this. There's nobody looking at David when Shimei is throwing rocks and saying, oh man, there's David, he's a coward. No, everybody knows the kind of warrior David is. So that's not even a question. Shimei is of Israel. Of the people that had direct issues with Judah. And you know what King David needed in that moment? Please hear this. He needed, he needed to not create more fractures and more division by having people of Judah kill people of Israel. He needed to bring healing. He needed to bring the people together. And so by being gracious to Shimei, yes, he was rec recognizing his sin. Yes, he was recognizing that much of this was due to his course. But you know what he was also doing? He was also having men of Judah understand the need to not go to battle against men of Israel. Why? Because all it would do would be creating more divide and more problems and more fighting amongst the people that are all supposed to be one. He, okay, a couple things. He didn't need to show he was strong. He was already known as strong. He didn't need to establish himself. He was established. And he didn't have to worry about men like Shimei posing a real threat to him. He had seen it all before. Also, with a man like Joab, he also knew this, that Joab lost real friends in the conflict. Now, now listen, we read, these, we read these stories sometimes and we have to remember, like, these are human beings. And so when Israel fights Judah and the Bible says that the men were put to the worst or that they played, the Bible talks about them playing in sport and people dying, you have to remember that men like Joab saw men he loved and men he served with and men he cared about dying because of men like Abner. And so David, while David saw that and knew that, he, he, was, he was giving Joab time to, to understand to, can I say this way? He was giving Joab grace, understanding that all Joab had known was battle and war, and he was trying to work together to bring unity among the people of Judah and Israel and not allow it to escalate and fracture the people worse. He needed to teach the men to care about the other tribes. So he gave room, 
He allowed men to throw stones. And he even allowed men like Joab to do some things. Because he didn't want to create. Listen, so now David kills Joab for killing Abner. Now what's that going to do? That's going to cause more problems with Judah and Israel. Another man goes down because of Israel. You know what, you know what David's doing? David is understanding the, the situation that he's walking into. He understands the people that he's supposed to be leading. And here's what he's saying. He's saying here is the best way to handle this. To get us as a nation to where God wants us to be. David didn't have to worry about, he didn't have to worry about any of these dynamics because he knew that God was for him and God would take care of him. Matter of fact, he, David even knew that in the midst of all this stuff with Absalom, David knew God was with him. And there was a confidence and there was an experience that allowed him to apply wisdom in such a way that he didn't have to worry about all these different things. His focus was to bring unity. That's why, and by the way, when you see, you see that, that God used that when, when the captains uh, were slain and the Bible says that David mourned for their death. When Amasa died and when Abner died, the Bible says that David mourned for their death. You know what the Bible says? That the people of Israel saw that and it drew the people of Israel to trust in David more. It, David's concern for unity, David's understanding of what the people needed at that time and having the security as a, as a strong man allowed for him to deal with the nation in a way so that he could bring together what they needed. Okay, but let's talk about Solon, Solomon for a minute. He's new. There's no record of Solomon being declared as a man of war. There's no Goliath. There's, there's no, get it, there's no great generals that have gone to battle with him, fighting with him. Solomon was not, was not in the same position as David coming into the kingdom because Solomon didn't have the history that David had. Solomon would, Solomon would need to establish strength to prevent an uprising against him. Whereas David, he had the loyalty and he knew, he knew that they knew he was a man of war and there would be no perception of weakness on his point. Solomon was in a completely different place as a young man. People would be watching how he handled rock throwers. People would be watching, is he a man of strength? And you know what happened? If Solomon showed weakness, all of a sudden, men of influence and power might rise up against Solomon and Solomon didn't have the Goliath history for people to stay with him. Solomon was dealing with a kingdom in a different place as a different leader and as a result, do you know what David's saying to Solomon? Please hear this. He's not saying what I did was wrong. He's saying, Solomon, you need to do something different than what I did because you're in a different place as a king than I was. See, Joab couldn't overthrow David but there was a chance that he could overthrow Solomon. Shimei couldn't hurt David. But one Shimei against a Solomon could turn into 50 Shimeis against Solomon. And it could hurt David at this point in the kingdom. And so what David is saying is not simply, he's not simply saying, oh, my feelings are hurt and I'm bitter. Wipe all these people out. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, get this, you know what these men have done and what they're capable of. And I was able to weather that. And I was able to handle that. And I was able to swear unto the Lord that I would not deal with that. But Solomon, that's not where you are. And that's why he says, thou art a wise man. Why is he saying thou art a wise man? He's saying, because you know very well where you are, the situation of the kingdom, what's taking place. And here's what you know, Solomon. You know you need to handle this. What you see here is not an inconsistency in David. It is wisdom in understanding the circumstances he is in. You know, we all love consistency. Kids want to be, you know, brothers and sisters all want to be treated the same. Church members want to see a pastor handle the things the same. Employees want all incidents handled the same. But, and, 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 when there is inconsistency, here's what, here's what our immediate response is, injustice. Come on, if you've been a parent, well, you let so-and-so do that. Injustice. 
They said that, and that's the only punishment that they got. Every oldest child in the family has seen gross injustice with the youngest child. That doesn't seem fair. Why did he do it to this person but not to this person? Why did he allow this or why did she allow that and not allow this? Because here's why. Oftentimes the differences are not favoritism or inconsistencies as much as they are matters of wisdom. Okay, let me work us through this. So wisdom, first of all, can we set this? Wisdom begins with the, not, with, with the knowledge of the truth of the word of God. Okay, so please hear me. I am not suggesting that wisdom is this. All right, let me see here how I want to handle this here situation. Well, I think this is the best way here. I think this is the best way here. That's not wisdom. Wisdom says, okay, what does God's word say about this? What does God want here? Okay, now, now I've established what God says. Now what is the best way to do this here? What is the best way to do this here? So a parent understands that the Bible talks about correction of children, right? But anybody who's parented children understands that you correct children, but you don't always correct children the exact same way. Why? Because there is wisdom in understanding who you're dealing with and what's taking place. Wisdom understands different leaders must apply truth differently. They must apply truth, but it doesn't always take the same shape and form at the same time. Why is that? Let me just give you some reasons. Leaders come into different relationships, to situations at different stages, with different goals and different focuses, different levels of trusts, different levels of bonds. And oftentimes, if you're dealing with different people, get this, they're different people. So the Bible, please hear me, the Bible will always be the same. But the overall goals and direction can look different depending on a situation. I, I was thinking about this this week. Me and Pastor Fisher were having coffee this week. And you know, I'm so thankful to have Pastor Fisher in our church and his wife. Man, what a treasure, amen, to be able to have the Pastor Emeritus, former pastor. I don't like to say former pastor, but you know what I mean. The pastor before me. And the current pastor together in the same church. And we like each other. At least, at least he smiles at me like he likes me. <laughs> we're having coffee and we're talking about Vision Sunday. And I'm not going to obviously devote the details of what we're talking about. But, but you know one of the things we talked about is you know. And if you haven't caught this. You know me and Pastor Fisher aren't exactly the same people. And we were talking about the renderings and different things and things that he's done and things that I'm doing. And, and, and the truth is this, that since I've come here, I've done some things different than Pastor Fisher does them. And, and, and when those things take place, we can do this. Here's what we can do. We can, look over at, we can look over at Pastor David and say, oh, yeah, see, he did this, and he's doing this, and Pastor Fisher's doing that. And Brother Hetzer, oh, now he's got, you know, he's got charts or he's got this. So he's, that's a very secular way of doing things. And Pastor Fisher, they, he didn't do all that. He's a much more spiritual person. Or you can flip it around. They say, oh, Pastor Fisher, you know, he didn't have all this organization and this and that. And, Pastor, and you know what we do? We start comparing and contrasting each other. Um, but can I just remind us of a couple things? Now, Pastor Fisher uh, came here at a different time than I came. And, and by the way, over the 40 years that he was here, I think he would say this, and those of you who have been here that long, you'd know that even Lighthouse, under his time as a pastor, experienced different phases where he went at things different. Now, I've got some of those red-hot sermons where he's kicking over the pots. Yeah, buddy. If you think, you, you, you've not listened to old-time Pastor Fisher, you need to get yourself, you need to talk to Brother Knight and get your hands on some old-time preacher. You know what you'll see, though? You'll see differences even in his, in his style. Why? Because you know why? Different people, different time, different stages. I think we would agree. You know, we came after COVID. I think our church is a little different post-COVID than pre-COVID. Church is in a vastly different circumstance than it was five years ago or six years ago or seven years ago. So you know what that means? Probably, whether I was the pastor or Pastor Fisher was the pastor or someone else was the pastor, probably some of the things would have to be different 
because we're in a different place in a different stage trying to do different things than maybe we had been doing five years ago. And it's amazing that two men can sit and have coffee, maybe doing things completely different, but absolutely valuing one another and learning and, and, you know, more me on my side learning and a lot of learning and listening, even though I'm doing things differently. Why? Because in his time, in his stage, in his place, you know what he was doing? He was applying wisdom. And maybe if I were right then and I, were, and I was in that same place, maybe I'd be doing the exact same thing he did if I were doing the wisdom of God for that time. You, you see... You see, even, even as we go into this year as a church and we talk about vision and all the, the there's, there's things that are different, please get this, but it's not about, it's not about who did this or who did that or which is better. It's, it's this, that David had to do some different things than Solomon had to do. I think it's fair to say, I, mean, I, I know you're good to us and you love us, but probably some of you probably know, know Pastor Fisher a little better than you know me. You've known him for decades and so there's a relationship. There are some things that are different. Therefore, there's just a lot of things that happen and take place differently. And that's the case in home. That's the case at work. That's the case in church. That's the, that's the case in how we handle things and deal with things. It's not, that, it's not that we say, oh, well, this person's special and this person's not special. It's that different people are different and there's different situations. And we use the same word of God, but we might have to handle some things differently. And I want to say this tonight, that, that, that if, you know, as I've been here this time, if there are things I do different, if there are changes that I feel led to make, it's not because I think that this way is better than that way. Here's what I think. I think that this is where we are as a church, and this is what we need at this time for this church to get to where God wants us to go. And I thank God for what we did 10 years ago. I thank God for what we did 15 years ago. I thank God for what we did 30 years ago. But we are in 2024, and we've got to do what God wants us to do right here and right now for his glory. And so it's not about comparing or contrasting and there's learning mercy you can learn and you can ask questions and you can glean about how did you do this or how did you handle that but the reality is is that wisdom is the ability to take truth and apply it as it is necessary for different stages in time and that's why David could be having rocks thrown at him and say do not touch him we commend him to the Lord and then at the end of his life look over at Solomon and say take his head off. And still be the same man. And still be just as close to God as he was back then. Why? Because he knew that for the sake of Solomon. Solomon, you need to do this for, you, for where you are as a king. Where you are at this time. You have to show force here. Because I didn't have to do that. I showed force when I held up Goliath's head. But you're going to have to show force here. So that the people will rally behind you. The men will believe in you. The generals will follow you. So you need to do this because thou art a wise man. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like throwing a football. I wanted to use a paper airplane in this illustration, but I couldn't make it work. It's like throwing a football. You, you can use the exact same mechanics to throw a football, but if you throw it 50 yards or 20 yards, or if someone's um, defending someone, you're going to throw it differently, even though you're using the same mechanics and the same ball. Wisdom is very much the same way. We take the same word and the same mechanics, but we're paying attention to what's taking place and how we do it. And, the, and so what we learn and what we understand from King David tonight is this. What appears to be inconsistency is often actually wisdom. What appears to be cons inconsistency. Like, I don't understand why he let that slide. Even though a lot of times we think something slides and it didn't. But it might appear. I don't know why this slide. I don't know why he came down over here. No, look. And it is possible. It is inconsistency. It's possible. Human beings can be inconsistent. Sometimes, you know what, parents? We're just tired. And you know what we said? I had three kids and you're the fourth. And so you're going to live in the age of grace. Because I am tired. And that's not what we want. But sometimes it's just how it works out. And so there can be inconsistencies, but sometimes it's this, I know what you need. And I know that you think I'm, I'm, way, I'm way softer on this person, but you know what? They are softer than you. And so I'm going to go at this differently, but they'll get dealt with. David here wasn't a man of grace or vengeance. He was a man of wisdom. And just as he understood where he was at that time by the Spirit of God to say, let him throw stones. 
He was able to look at a young Solomon and say, you are about to enter into a tumultuous time of the kingdom when there has my Adonijah has risen up against you. By the way, Adonijah is still living at this time. Generals have been bold enough to rise up against me. And Solomon, you're going to have to approach this a little different than I did because you're taking the kingdom at a little different state than I did. And he was a man of wisdom. Okay, a couple things and we're done. Wisdom doesn't disregard the Bible. It determines the speed, force, and extent of the enforcement of it. I'm going to say that again because that's really good. Wisdom doesn't disregard the Bible. It determines the speed. What do you mean the speed? How quick are we going to jump in on this thing with this? The force. How much force are we going to apply? And the extent. How much of this are we going to apply to this situation? Number two, now I do think there's a challenge here for us to consider though too. Be careful of using wisdom to mask cowardice. Sometimes we can say, oh, I'm just applying good wisdom. And the reality is we just don't want to deal with something. But we know we should. So we have to be careful about that. We have to really in our heart by the Holy Ghost know this is wisdom. This isn't just us covering up for our lack of wanting to handle something. Number three. You cannot demand someone to handle something exactly the same when it's not exactly the same. You see, a lot of times we look at a situation, our situation, we'll see it's the exact same. But you know what? Very rarely is it the exact same. And so you're not always going to see the same result. The concept of wisdom, this was, this was something... Preacher that the Lord really gave me this week. I've been thinking about this all week. The concept of wisdom allows you to appreciate different approaches to leadership. See, understanding wisdom and understanding you don't copy and paste everything allows different leaders to appreciate each other and understand the differences in each other. And it allows for a Lighthouse Baptist Church to be able to look back and look forward and appreciate the different things that God did with both men. And say, man, wasn't that awesome? Man, that was awesome. That was amazing how the Lord did this. And how, oh, I'll tell you what, preacher did this. I remember when Pastor Fisher did this and the Lord led. No, appreciate that and enjoy that. And the same thing, hopefully, moving forward, you'll have some things to appreciate. But wisdom allows you to do that. Because you realize that it's not always one way. It's the ability to apply things rightly at the right stage, at the right point, with the right people at the right time. And then I think this is a big, a big thing, and this is what I'm going to end with. Prayer, patience, and counsel are all necessary for discerning wisdom. You know, you know he's going to get this charge from, from his dad, and you know what he's going to ask God for later on? Wisdom. Oh, he says, I'm a little kid. I don't even know how to go in or out. I have no clue. He says to God, I have no clue what I'm doing. I need you to give me wisdom. And the reality is, is that because of the fact that you can't always just copy and paste situations in dealing with people, here's what that means. It means you better be in step with the Holy Spirit. It means this, that you're going to have to pray. It means you're going to have to sometimes be patient and allow emotion and allow things to kind of settle down. And here's what it means a lot of times. It means you might need counsel for someone to help you. Because it's not always the same answer the same way the same time. I, you know, it's, 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 it's sometimes I remember, you know, you'll talk to a Bible college student. And they want to ask you all these questions. And they ask you these questions. And they'll be like, okay, so when this happens, you do this. And you, and you, and you almost sound like double-minded because you're like, well, sort of. It depends on a variety of factors. No, no, no. But so if this happens, you know, that's what we like, right? But the reality is it doesn't always work that way. And so the importance is we must know the book, we must know the truth, we must know what God wants, and then we pray and we seek and we have counsel and we try to use wisdom so that the kingdom moves forward for the glory of God in the way that God would have it to come. And so we look at David, man, look at him, stones being thrown at him, and then we see David take his head off. And we say... Man of grace or man of vengeance? And David says, no, 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 no. Man of wisdom. May God help us to be people of wisdom. Father, we love you tonight. 
I want to thank you for your word. And, and Lord, I'm so thankful for the wisdom that you've given to our church, not just from preacher, but from many others, Lord, who have served here and, and, and done your work here. We thank you for all that's been done. And we thank you for the wisdom that you're providing now. We pray you continue to give it, supply it. We need wisdom. And maybe there's some tonight, they're in a situation where, where, where they don't know exactly what to do. They don't, know, they don't know exactly how to go in or to go out. And maybe the prayer tonight would be, God, would you give me wisdom with this situation? Would you help me navigate through it? I pray, dear Father, however you've spoken, that we'd respond to your word tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, every eye closed, as we stand to our feet tonight, the altar is open if you'd like to come, if you'd like to kneel where you are. Let's just respond to God however he's spoken tonight.